welcome everyone to today's special event hosted by Southern Arizona Senior Pride. We are delighted to have Food Network's Ted Allen and author John Birdsall presenting In the Kitchen Closet, The Secret Gay Life of Culinary Giant, James Beard. I'm Keith Ashley, Associate Director of Senior Pride and I'd like to share a few Zoom housekeeping tips with you before we get started today. All audience members have been muted and we would like to ask that you please remain muted for the duration of the event. John and Ted have graciously offered to remain with us for 15 minutes after their presentation in order to answer any questions. If you would like to submit questions, please share them in the chat function located at the bottom of your Zoom window. I will present them to Ted and John after the interview. Finally, today's event will be recorded and shared on Southern Arizona Senior Pride's website and YouTube channel. Now, please let me introduce you to Senior Pride's Executive Director, Lavina Tomer. Hello, everyone. I'm excited that there are people joining us from all over Arizona, from several other states, and even from Mexico and Canada. Welcome. Many in our LGBTQI community have struggled, as James Beard did, with discrimination, fear of losing our careers, and isolation. Senior Pride advocates for equity and inclusion. Our programs provide connection, learning, and community resources. We are a grassroots, mostly volunteer organization with a vision to be here for future generations. If you have al already donated, thank you very much. If you have not yet had the opportunity to support our mission, you may still do so by going to our website, which is listed in the chat. And now, enjoy John Birdsall, author of The Man Who Ate Too Much, and Emmy Award winner, Ted Allen, from the Food Network. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank, uh, I'm panting because I ran back to the house. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Southern Arizona Pride for, uh, I want to thank Southern Arizona Senior Pride for having us. John and I have spoken before. I'm a huge fan of his book, The Man Who Ate Too Much, and I'm really happy to delve a little deeper into the subject of your book. Hi, John. Uh, I wonder if John is muted. I'm unmuted now. I should be. Okay. I hear you. Hey. Um, it's great to see you again, John. Yeah, great to see you too. You're in a very rustic cabiny sort of sort of a setting, which looks great. <laughs> I am in my friend Peter's uh, woodshed outside his house in the beautiful Catskills, where it's pouring rain, but that's nice and fresh, and it's a fun place to be. Nice. So I want to say to everyone who's uh, who is joining us first, thank you for being here. Thanks again to Southern Arizona Senior Pride for hosting us, and I think virtually anyone who's ever been to a restaurant knows about the James Beard Awards, but not everybody knows about the interesting life of this man who was very much the Dean of American cooking. And I'm trying so hard not to say James Dean, the beard of American cooking. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but then again, I just did. So James was an international, internationally famous celebrity. He, was, he, had a lot, he had a television show on Friday nights in prime time on NBC in the 40s and is widely considered by most people to be the first celebrity chef. But how did he get here? Um, he was born in 1903 in Portland, Oregon, had ambitions of becoming an actor, I think also an opera singer, am I, am I right, John? Yeah, that's right, a tenor. Uh, and like so many aspiring actors and singers, he moved to New York City and found himself working as a caterer. <laughs> A, pr a proud tra tradition that continues to this day. Uh, but as uh, a high society cater caterer in Manhattan in the 40s and 50s and 60s, he developed uh, great relationships with a whole lot of people in New York society. And all of these things led to him becoming 
a very well-known person and, a, and a, uh, a very prolific author. Many, what is it, about 15 books, John? Uh, actually, 22. James Dean wrote 22 books, uh, quite an achievement, and very well-regarded books as well. Um, but why don't we start from the start? Um, John, I've, as we know, uh, yours is not the first James Beard biography. That's, uh, there have been many. Uh, yours is the first one in 25 years. Can you talk about why you felt it was important to go a little deeper into James' personal life and James's life as a queer person, uh, which is something that not everybody knows? Yeah, well, there are two main reasons. One, um, you know, I grew up in California, uh, a suburb of San Francisco. And so in the late 1960s, um, my parent, my, our, our neighbors and my parents' best friends in the neighborhood were a gay couple uh, named Pat and Lou. Um, my brother and I loved them. We became really, really close. They would babysit for us. We would spend the night at their house when my parents wanted, wanted to get us away. Um, and so I got to be really intimately involved with these two men who, you know, even though it was the Bay Area, it was the 1960s. And so they had to be really careful about their identity. Um, and I saw that they lived, you know, really a double life. Um, they had this really rich emotional life in private that we were part of. Um, that revolved around food, but publicly they had to be very careful. You know, many people in our neighborhood did not approve of them. Um, so I felt like I had an emotional connection to that generation uh, and previous generations who had to live um, in a very careful, careful way and had this split between public and private. And then in 2013, I wrote an essay for the print magazine Lucky Peach called America, Your Food is So Gay. Um, and I talked about uh, my gay uncles, Pat and Lou. Um, and I had worked at, you know, at that point, I had worked in restaurant kitchens myself for about 17 years. And so I had the experience of homophobia in restaurant kitchens. Um, and it really bothered me that, you know, every chef that I ever worked for, um, homophobic or not, really uh, wanted to win a James Beard Award. You know, that's the highest honor, the Oscars of the food world. Um, and so I thought, I just felt this sense of injustice, you know, having known what my gay uncles went through, um, you know, that every chef wanted James Beard's image around their neck on a medal, uh, even ones who were really homophobic um, in the kitchen. And so I really felt that uh, even though James's life story had been told before in two biographies uh, and told really well, um, I felt like it was time for a biography that really centered his sexuality that really centered his um, gay identity. Well, Hale, it, it must strike you as, as it does me as extraordinarily strange that the very industry that is so welcoming to LGBTQ people in the front of the house right. has a homophobia problem in the back of the house. What, how, that is a huge incongruity. How does that happen? Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I have to say that things you know, things are changing and things are changing fast. And so I think, you know, there's less homophobia than there used to be uh, in restaurant kitchens. And I found it mostly in high-end restaurants um, where there's more pressure, um, you know, that are more based on that classic French, you know, brigade system where mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very almost militarized, you know, where the chef is the commander at the top and there's a strict sense of, um, of you know, towing the line. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, front of house has long been associated, I mean, it's crazy, but the kind of restaurant universe has been sort of gendered in a way. And so front mm -hmm. of house has been, you know, typically a realm where, you know, women could be servers and it's about sort of, you know, taking care of diners. So it has this kind of nurturing quality. Um, so, you know, it's a safer place for queer people to work than in the kitchen, which has been typically really kind of top down overwhelmingly male. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's a strange duality, you know, and, and that's where, you know, in my experience working in kitchens, that's where a lot of homophobia was expressed, you know, it would be people in the back of the house, 
under this, you know, strict rule, um, you know, kind of, you know, either casually or really formally being sort of homophobic, um, you know, especially about queer people, you know, queer waiters and, and staff in front of house. So yeah, it's a very- so, Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So uh, let's, get, let's get back to James himself. We're talking about a guy who if uh, once was showed a quantity of seafood stew that a cook was preparing, who said this ought to be enough for, for 12 people and Beard interjected to say, I, I think that's more like six or eight people. Uh, he was a, a man, he was a large man of large appetites. What is it that people who don't know more about James Beard really need to know to understand what made this, this man tick? Yeah, I mean, I think to appreciate James's, um, you know, public persona of being someone just completely exuberant, completely in love with uh, life, completely in love with eating, with entertaining, with drinking. Um, a food writer in New York City told me a story um, similar to your seafood stew one. Um, she was accompanying James sort of towards the end of his life to um, an appearance at New College in New York City. And uh, James goes and the speaker there is this, was this, you know, well-known um, sausage maker in New York City. He had this sort of celebrated uh, shop where he sold sausage. Mm -hmm. James was delighted to see him because he used to be a customer there. And um, at the end of their talk, <laughs> the food writer sort of looked and James Beard was like stuffing his pockets with sausages that this baker <laughs> had brought. He was gonna take them home, you know, to his kitchen and devour them. You know, his mouth was like watering. Um, and I think to really understand what a sea change that was in American food, you have to look at what came before James Beard, what was new about him. And American food in the 1940s, you know, James Beard wrote his first cookbook in uh, 1940, um, the American food landscape was really vastly different. And it was centered on uh, nutrition, it was centered on eating, you know, frugally and um, sensibly. And there was almost a sense of, you know, this very sort of Calvinist sense of shame about enjoying, you know, about enjoyment and pleasure, and especially enjoyment and pleasure about food. Um, you know, Americans uh, didn't eat out a lot. I mean, they would eat out in, you know, hamburger stands and casual restaurants. But eating out was an occasion and it was expensive. And you would go to a fancy French, French restaurant typically where the food wasn't perhaps great, but it was fancy and expensive. Um, and so Americans ate for all these other reasons apart from taste, deliciousness, the enjoyment of pleasure. And James, in this really democratizing way really unlocked this sense to ordinary Americans that they could feel okay about enjoying food, that they could be, oh, that they should in fact shop in a different way, um, you know, that, um, that really valued pleasure, flavor, seasonality, all the things we think of today as, you know, part of the farm to table movement. You see that uh, really pioneering work in James Beard, you know, really early on in the 1940s and certainly the 1950s. I mean, I think the, the, the United States in the past 20 years or so has experienced a, a different kind of revolution in food in which all, virtually every city in America from, you know, Louisville to Nashville to Albany, New York, suddenly has an, not only an enormous range and variety of cuisines, but, but has truly artisanal chefs really working to make people with a, vo a point of view, people with something to say. Back in the era you're talking about in the 40s and 50s, the only fine dining in the United States was super expensive French. That was kind of it. Right. And the bounty we enjoy now, uh, I, would you say James also worked to encourage people to explore other kinds of cu other cuisines in addition to fancy French? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, and um, you know, part of his mission really, really early on was to convince Americans to eat more widely. I mean, you know, in the early 1950s, the, the you know, the great, great in quotes, the great American accomplishment was the supermarket and this um, food distribution system, 
that you know meant you could buy tomatoes in January, you could buy strawberries year round. You know, this was yeah. considered this huge achievement, and it was really in a way, but it was you know exactly antithetical to good eating, to food that tasted good. You know, tomatoes would be would 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 look perfect in the supermarket. You know, each one would be the same size, um, but that's not a recipe for cooking that tastes good. And James Beard really did, um, you know, for instance, his 1954 book uh, ab about fish, James Beard's um, fish cookery was real was really um, uh, a sort of manifesto about Americans to sort of reject the three or four types of seafood that they might find in the supermarket and to eat really widely and to actually keep species alive by eating them and to eat what was available, of course, in their local area because, you know, at that time there wasn't great national distribution. Um, and it was like this sort of passionate plea for Americans to have more curiosity, to eat more widely, to eat for pleasure, um, to really explore what was around them rather than, um, you know, as I say, just going to the supermarket and buying what was available there. It was really a kind of empowering message for Americans of all incomes to really um, take control of their food and to, to, to you know, eat and cook with an, with, with an eye to pleasure. I think empowering is a really important word to describe what James did. And he also was empowering people to be ambitious. He wouldn't just, you know, cook a little fillet. He would teach people how to cook a whole, a gigantic sea bass uh, and, and aspire to doing things that they may have previously thought were beyond their reach. Um, also exciting. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, you made reference to his um, ambitions to be an actor uh, and to be an opera singer. And so James Beard really uses his theatrical training, um, certainly his theatrical ambitions to uh, teach Americans how to cook in this way with lots of lots of flair and personality. Um, you mm -hmm. know, for instance, at the same time that French food was the peak of American dining, um, it was also just very, very intimidating to Americans, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, dishes that had French names and dishes that seemed too fancy. And one of James Beard's um, sort of regular uh, dishes that he would teach in his cooking classes was a souffle. Um, and so he really, you know, his goal was to demystify the making of a souffle. And he did it with a lot of, a lot of panache, you know, his sort of famous trick was in showing his students how to, how to, how to beat the egg whites to the proper stage that they would be stiff. You know, he would whip them in a copper bowl and sort of hold the bowl over his head, you know, while you know, some students gasped. <laughs> so basically just um, sort of trying to get people unafraid to cook, you know, that. that... So, and we're talking about, you know, decades before Emeril ever issued forth his first BAM, you oh, know, absolutely. James Beard was, 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 ex was exclaiming, I love to eat, which right. in fact was the, the title of his show uh, in the 40s, that exuberance and that can-do spirit and that every, you know, encouraging everyone from all walks of life and incomes to look at food as, as, as you said, as an act of, as something you can, you can enjoy, that it can be pleasurable, that it can, but also that it can be a cultural experience. And I consider food to this day to be the very best way to study or get, an, get a world, get an idea of somebody else's worldview. When you eat a dish from Marrakesh or you eat a dish from Egypt or you eat a dish from Rome, you, you, you're learning about a culture in a way that you, without even leaving your, your home. Yeah, and, and you know, James, he, he had a rocky relationship with um, Gourmet Magazine, which, you know, uh, started publishing in the 1940s, and James was an early contributor. Um, and at some point in the late 1940s, he wrote uh, restaurant reviews for Gourmet, um, you know, reviews of restaurants around, around uh, New York City. And I think, you know, part of how James didn't fit in with the gourmet magazine of that decade, which was all about sort of fancy, fancy French food is he, you know, reviewed what were then considered to be ethnic restaurants, you know, like he reviewed an Indian restaurant in, in Manhattan. Yeah. And, you know, a, um, you know, Hungarian place. And these were places that were more casual, less expensive, really, you know, urging New Yorkers to, um, you know, eat, eat, 
you know, n not just to eat on the Upper East Side or something like that, but to, you know, explore the city at large, to eat in Lower Manhattan, you know, to go to the Fulton Fish Market and go to a couple of really kind of burly, you know, daytime restaurants that served great fish from the market and to be sort of unafraid of the market and the smell, you know, people, Americans were always afraid that fish would be too fishy, that it would be smelly. Um, and so James was really sort of encouraging this widening sense of, um, you know, eating and what, you know, American food was, you know, to really expand it beyond this kind of narrow idea of what, what American food was considered. Can you talk about how James's early march to fame and national being known nationally began? I, I understand that he was a darling on the society uh, circuit in New York City, but what was it that got him in front of a camera? And what was it that started getting him booked? Was it, was it Gourmet? Was it his writing for Gourmet that got him connected to publishers? Um, Actually, Gourmet was slightly later. Um, he wrote his first book in 1940 before Gourmet was around. But James really got fame, you know, locally in New York City because of the catering company that you mentioned. Uh, it was a company that uh, James started with a brother and sister, uh, Bill and Irma Rohde. Um, and they, um, they together um, really did something new in catering they focused on parties, cocktail parties on the Upper East Side. And so this was um, 1938, they formed, the, they formed the company and, you know, cocktail parties after prohibition ended, you know, the cocktail party was the favorite way of New Yorkers to entertain, but the food was atrocious. The drinks were often atrocious, you know, martinis in Manhattans would be made in huge batches before the party, they'd be watered down, they wouldn't be very good. And the food would be, you know, sort of lifeless canapes on stale bread, not very imaginative at all, you know, throwing a few fancy imported French ingredients on stale bread rounds. <laughs> and James mm -hmm. really approached catering with this sense of um, cooking in a restaurant, you know, like really fine cooking in a restaurant. And so, you know, they would buy different breads around New York City um, and do really, um, you know, imaginative, imaginative things with food um, and it didn't help that James's partner, Bill was extremely handsome and charismatic. And so while James was in the basement making delicious foods, his partner, Bill was a darling of society columnists in New York City because he was really, really handsome, which of course is why James was really attracted to him in the first place. Um, and so, you know, together they really charmed all of these wealthy, hostesses on the Upper East Side and got notoriety uh, for their company. Um, and because of that, James was offered uh, his first cookbook deal, a fairly small publisher, um, you know, Barrows. But James had ambitions and also felt, um, you know, really unhappy with the sense that Bill, his handsome partner, was getting all the attention. So James sort of you know, wrote about hors d'oeuvres that they all had developed, you know, without mentioning them, <laughs> sort of taking credit for it all, which is another theme in James Beard's life. So it's fun to, uh, James was um, always a fairly big man in both height and, uh, and when you talk about uh, writing a book that explores um, his life, to me, it seems impossible to tell someone's story without talking about their loves. And, uh, and their struggles with love. And before he got himself his handsome husband, um, I'm thinking back, and I don't know if people know this, but the, but the James Beard house is still, is still right where James left it on West 12th Street in New York City and is open, and, and is open to the public with tickets for tours. And it's a wonderful place to see. And when, you're, and when you tour James Beard's house, you'll see that his bed is up on a platform uh, in one of the rooms, I think it's on the second floor, and that there are mirrors above it, which suggests a lot of things. Um, what, what, what was it like back in those days before he settled down with his handsome husband to date as a closeted gay man, even in New York, uh, and for a person of not, who would not be described as traditionally handsome himself? Do you know, uh, do you have a window into that? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, generally um, for everyone, 
um, being, you know, living an active gay life, an active queer life was tremendously risky. Um, you know, um, even in a place like Greenwich Village in New York City, which had some tolerance for you know, lesbians and gays, it was um, a really dangerous place. You know, you could be uh, entrapped in Washington Square Park by the police. Yeah. You know? Let's let's not forget, especially for our our, our younger viewers, that uh, even in New York City gay behavior was illegal it was criminal yeah and the penalties were really severe i mean you would um you know your name would be published in the newspaper so you might lose your job you know you probably lose your job um in other places you know smaller smaller places in the midwest in the west uh you could very well be prosecuted. Uh, you might spend time in jail, um, but you would certainly, you know, your life would be over um, in many ways. Your public life would be over in many ways. And this was still a risk in New York City. Um, you know, James was, later friends sort of described James's earlier behavior as kind of indiscreet. Um, you know, he had mm -hmm. this as, it, as I say, very kind of theatrical quality. So it was really hard for James to kind of contain himself. Um, but, you know, lives had to be so boxed off, so compartmentalized. Um, you know, your queer life had to be so um, um, separate from your public life, your working life. Uh, Ruth Reichel, uh, who was the editor of Gourmet Magazine for a number of years, she told me that, that, that still the story of how James Beard got fired from Gourmet Magazine in the 1940s was um, the offices of Gourmet Magazine were in the Plaza Hotel. The Plaza Hotel also contained uh, the Oak Room, which was a sort of bar and restaurant. And it was a well-known place for gay men sort of discreetly to hook up to kind of meet each other and hook up. And so, you know, one day <laughs> um, after working at the office, a number of people from Gourmet Magazine went downstairs um, to the Oak Bar and James talked a little too freely about his sexuality, talked a little too freely about being attracted to men. Word got to the gourmet publisher, Earl McGoslin, and James was fired um, you know, for some other pretext, but really it was just that he was too much of a risk. It was, he was just being too open. Um, and part of what I explore in the book is um, my feeling, uh, my belief that part of uh, James Beard's um, ideas about food his ideas for Americans to eat in a different way, to eat with pleasure, intention, to eat seasonally, um, because it was safer to be gay elsewhere than the United States. I mean, it was still risky, but if you went to Paris, uh, if you went to Barcelona, uh, it was less risky. You know, you could sort of cruise men openly on the street in certain places without being arrested. Um, and so James spent as much time as he could in places with very different food cultures than the United States. Um, and so he really absorbed all of these lessons, not just, not just about his sexuality, not just about you know, expressing who he was sexually uh, in other countries, but really you know, learned, learned about food there, sort of brought all of those lessons about food back to the US and kind of incorporated them into what seemed like this, um, you know, Native American sense of food about eating for pleasure. So, you know, to me, James Beard's sexuality and his ideas about food, his lessons about food are, um, you know, inextricably linked, um, that they're really, you know, part of the same impulse in his life. And and even today, uh, we talked about you know food as a window into culture. Uh, what a wonderful! There's no better way to learn more about food than than to travel uh, when you can. And I guess that served a couple of James's needs. Um, sure. <clears throat> can we talk? You mentioned Ruth uh, and some other women that that played roles. And um, can we talk about the roles that women chefs and women uh, members of the who, many of whom have always been. Uh, titans in the culinary business. How did women uh, 
play a role in Jane's rise to prominence? James owed everything to women. <laughs> I mean, everything in his in his public career about food. Every, you know, essentially all of his knowledge about food he owed to women. I mean, of course, women couldn't. I mean, except in certain rare places, you know, like Lyon, France, women couldn't really be 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 chefs. Um, but you know, James worked in a field. You know, food publishing, food writing was a field that was predominantly um, staffed by women. And so um, all of his influences, all of his friends uh, tended to be women who were working in the field. Um, you know, starting with his mother, um, his mother, Elizabeth Beard, um, who had run a boarding house before James was born. I mean, she really taught him really sort of grounded him in this sense of food and grounded him in the sense of food as a way of expressing emotion, uh, expressing emotions that couldn't otherwise be safely expressed. Um, and so, you know, he grew up um, um, really devoted to these key women in his life. Um, you know, when he went to London as a you know, student uh, at age 19, he was mentored by a woman who sort of introduced him to the sort of gay scene uh, in London, who introduced him to gay friends in Paris when he went there. Um, so really he had this history of um, you know, learning from strong women. Um, you know, unfortunately, especially publishing um, in the decades when James Beard was working, um, they weren't, um, they weren't friendly to women. And so it was sort of easy for James to get all the attention, even for things that he had learned from women and even things that he sort of borrowed from women. You know, he would use um, some of the more shameful parts of James's professional life where that he would kind of exploit and use uh, his colleagues, um, his great collaborator and friend, Helen Evans Brown, who was a Pasadena-based food writer, cookbook author, really brilliant, uh, creative force. Um, you know, he, James, um, she and James were collaborating on a book. It was published in 1955 about outdoor, outdoor cooking. And James mm -hmm. sort of did some kind of crappy things, you know, like borrowing recipes that they were saving to use together to publish in his own books. Um, and then sort of denying it, you know, saying, oh, um, that was just a mistake, you know, some papers got mixed up for the typist. Um, you know, he, James later acknowledged it in his, in his large um, sort of magnum opus, American Cookery of 1972. He, he dedicates it to the, to the great women um, of American kitchens, you know, starting with Fanny Farmer and these sort of 19th century cookbook authors. Um, and he realizes that he's you know, basically owed everything in his in his professional life to women. Isn't it remarkable that for all the progress that has been made in increasing uh, the acceptance of women doing whatever they want and whatever they're good at, uh, it there are many more, far more women chefs working in, in serious restaurants in the States than there were in James's era when there were none. And yet they remain the minority they, and they remain uh, I know lots of women chefs. I work with several of them on Chopped um, who talk about having much more difficulty getting funding than men have. Um, difficult, just difficulty in being respected. It's it, We've come a long way, but we're still not there. Isn't that kind of astonishing and appalling? Right. And, you know, especially women of color and especially queer, mm -hmm. like women of color. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, and, and, you know, especially for high end for, for high end restaurants and kitchens where you need, you know, investors, all that stuff. It's yeah, it's um, you know, in James, in James Beard's day, there were there was a small circle of gatekeepers, um, you know, centered in New York City who would, you know, decide cookbook publishing, would decide um, you know, who mattered in food. And mm. even though it was incredibly gendered. Um, you know, that food writing and being a food editor for, you know, a large national magazine would be something that a woman would do. Um, you know, James, in a sense, was exotic because he was a man working in this kind of women's field. 
So in a sense, he sort of naturally got attention because he was unusual as a man. And also just because of his personality, he would just sort of suck so much of the attention out of the room with this, you know, his large physical size and his large personality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it was definitely an injustice. Um, he took advantage of it for sure. So the, I will say there, were, there was something of a shift in American culture um, a little later into his career in the, when the 60s rolled into the 70s. And it, and, it, and it became a time when American men began to get his message and began to attend Beard's classes. Um, and I, I have a reference to uh, a 1970 article in Business Week and where, where Beard began to portray cooking as something that a man could enjoy in his leisure time, not along the lines of taking up painting. And I wonder, do we have uh, Beard to thank for bringing average American guys uh, to a place where it was okay to care about food and to obsess about food as we do? Because uh, it's my number one favorite thing to do is attempt to cook. Um, yeah. I, I mean, you know, in a way we do. And, and um, you know, part of, part of why James Beard was popular with publishers um, and magazine editors was that he could attract a male audience as well as a female audience. So he could, you know, potentially expand cookbook buying public uh, to men as well as women. I mean, in the 1930s, before James wrote his first book, there was a culture in the United States of male cooks and male um, um, cookbooks written written by men. They, they were smaller kind of niche books um, and men had a very specific role, which is that they were um, amateur, amateur gourmets. Um, you know, women were expected, their wives were expected to cook three squares a day for the family. But on mm -hmm. a Sunday or a special occasion, the man would enter the kitchen and make some kind of elaborate, <laughs> you know, highly seasoned dish, uh, his specialty. Um, and, you know, it was incredibly sexist, this sort of, you know, gendered landscape of food and cookbooks where men were you know, men were considered the true gourmets. You know, women had to work hard to cook, but you know, their food was 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 not the sort of peak of home cooking. What was new about James Beard is that he, um, you know, instead of fitting that male gourmet uh, slot, he really expanded it, and he wrote books about. He ended up writing books about everyday cooking, things that male authors did not write about. Um, you know, cooking three meals a day, cook, you know, practical cooking tips for the home. Um, and then when he started teaching cooking classes starting in 1955, um, he really appealed to men as well as to women. And that was really new. And it, 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 uh, it sort of threw the publishing industry and food media for a loop because um, there were a few other men besides James who were doing the same thing. Craig Claiborne came along, um, you know, in the later 1950s and started doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a little generation of gay men uh, who weren't publicly acknowledged to be gay, who were cooking experts, you know, Michael Field, Craig Claiborne. And so, it was an uncomfortable moment. There's a, um, there's a review in the New York Times in uh, I think 1964 by Nika Hazelton, who's doing a sort of year end roundup of all the cooks, of all the cookbooks published that year. And she notes that a number of them <laughs> are written by men. And she makes a kind of sickening joke where she says, you know, what is it about, you know, men in the kitchen? Of course, it's kind of inside knowledge in the, the New York food world that these men are gay, but it can't be acknowledged publicly. And she says, you know, uh, is the kitchen apron the new transvest transvestism? You know, ha ha ha. So it was very like uncomfortable sense of men coming into the kitchen and, you know, kind of breaking this gendered role of cooking, you know, making it okay for, you know, people of all genders to, um, you know, cook and to enjoy food and to, cook for families and loved ones to cook for parties. John, I think you might have just outed the New York Times writer <laughs> that referred to that cabal of gay uh, 
cooks as a <laughs> ring of fairies in the New York Times. Yeah, that was okay in the New York Times to it call was, a group of men a ring of fairies. It it, it was absolutely okay. I, I mean, it is just yeah. I mean, you know, as late as the 1970s, you know that you know that kind of argument was. A, a you know considered funny it was considered a, considered a joke um, i mean what is the problem with we american men why are we so insecure i think we need to get away from the restaurant conversation and figure out what's wrong with us males <laughs> and it has been for so long good lord yeah i mean it's it's it, it's that nurturing thing you know it's like we're you know you know women are supposed to nurture men are supposed to 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 be, you know, to be powerful, and um, you know, and that, and that, and the two aren't aren't supposed to meet. <laughs> I mean, I, I I collect cookbooks, and I've got s- several cookbooks. I, I, I used to work at Esquire, so I've got several cookbooks that are targeting men, and it's all about men, you know, cooking giant hunks of meat over over a live fire out in the backyard, and it just seems so silly. Um, it seems so silly. Yeah, and and um, you know, I mentioned that that. 1955 book, the complete book of outdoor cookery that James Beard did with Helen Evans Brown. Uh, mm-hmm. I have that one. And what you know, Helen Evans Brown, even though she was brilliant, she she had a more kind of traditional sense of what was acceptable in food publishing and things that women it was okay for women to do and things that were okay for men to do. Um, you know, James Beard, when he brought his ideas to the book, uh, to that book, he you know, he didn't hew to this line that it should be the man out, you know, on the patio at the grill cooking while the woman is in the kitchen making the salads to go with it. He sort of saw this kind of erasure of gender lines in this cooking scenario. Um, and the publisher didn't get it. And his collaborator, Helen, didn't didn't really get it. Um, it, it just, it didn't seem right. It was kind of unseemly. And it, it ended up not you know, the book ended up not reflecting that. Um, you know, it's not a very good book. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like, I enjoy owning it, but uh, I, I haven't yeah. cooked a heck of a lot yeah. out of it. Um, can we talk about, uh, get, so those of us who are in the LGBTQ uh, world, look back on Stonewall as the historic moment that uh, the corner was turned in the culture for us and the march toward liberation began. And James Beard, who lived very close to where the Stonewall Inn still is, uh, felt differently when that happened. Can you talk about why Stonewall was actually kind of a threat to someone like James Beard, a very famous person who was also very closeted? Yeah, so, uh, right. You know, as you say, uh, James Beard at that time was living on West 10th Street. He was just a a couple of blocks from the Stonewall Inn and was in New York City um, for that, that, that week of the Stonewall Rebellion in 1969. And, you know, at that point, James Beard was 66 years old. Um, you know, he was really at the height of his popularity. Something like Stonewall was a tremendous challenge to James Beard and his entire generation and also to his kind of generation of men primarily uh, gay men who were living in Greenwich Village, who had established a kind of safe realm or a semi-safe realm in New York City in Greenwich Village. Um, and so Stonewall and the gay liberation movement that spawned immediately after it um, really was a tremendous challenge. I mean, for one thing, it was a movement of much younger people. Um, and in the case of Stonewall, it was an event that um, you know included uh, lots of people of color, um, trans. Mm-hmm. It was um, he, you know James was James flirted in the 1950s with the Mattachine Society. Um, he had a good friend who was um, part of the Mattachine. Um, organization in San Francisco who I believe tried to recruit James to the sort of homophile movement of the time, mm-hmm. which was, um, you know, instead of arguing for radical change, it was saying that, well, you know, 
homosexuals are like anybody else. We're fine, upstanding citizens. We wear suits and dresses. We go to work like everybody else. We should be afforded the same rights. Um, Stonewall was antithetical to that message. It was about, um, you know, rebellion. It was about um, not being uh, content with incremental change. It was wanting liberation now. And that was tremendously challenging, I believe, to James Beard. Um, it was seductive in a way because, um, you know, he felt the pull of this, you know, huge cultural shift, this huge cultural and political shift. He'd always been really progressive in his politics. And so I believe was attracted to the message of liberation. But, you know, at that point, he, for one thing, had too much invested in his carefully closeted persona um, <laughs> that, you know, he would not have been able to write and sell books if he had sort of, you know, come out at that point. Um, you know, all of the, the, the whole weight of the sort of, you know, James Beard organization, um, you know, his, his, his publisher, his editors, anyone who worked with him, this would have been um, career suicide. And it would have, you know, in a way been um, a, a huge source of shame and disgrace for James Beard, the public person. Um, so he felt, you know, he felt a tremendous uh, conflict about what this big cultural shift meant. Um, you know, in the 1970s, he found ways um, he tried to, I think, subtly um, kind of express or you know, telegraph his support for the movement, um, you know, especially through his young assistant, Carl Jerome, uh, with James's assistant for about five years in the 1970s. Um, you know, at some point in the 70s, they're, they're in Miami and um, Carl, who's gay and very comfortable being out, he's in his early 20s, um, is going to a gay bar in Miami. And James says, you know, where are you going? Well, I'm going to a gay bar. You wouldn't want to go. And James is like, I'll go with you. <laughs> and um, really, yeah, I mean, you know, it was it was early in the evening, so there was nobody there. <laughs> and they mm -hmm. said, the bar. Carl told me it's a funny story there. You know, James Stewart was such a famous person, just his his image. Um, he, you know, Carl said there, like sitting at the bar, having you know, drinking beer in bottles. And there's two bartenders. <laughs> Carl sees them sort of whispering. And then one of the bartenders comes over and says, are you James Beer? <laughs> and James said, yes. And the bartender said, do you want your beer in a glass? <laughs> He's like, no. Kept on drinking out of the bottle. But yeah, I mean, this was, um, you know, this was a tremendous source of, source of conflict for James. And, you know, of course, he never, um, he never publicly came out. I mean, he died in early 1985. And, um, he talked with one of his friends about publicly coming out. Uh, this was in the late 1970s, but okay. didn't didn't do it. And you know, as I say, every everybody around him invested in you know his books, making money off him. You know, certainly would not have wanted James Beard to come out. It's it's funny because James's life prov provides a window into societal problems that many of which still exist. You talk about the gap. But you talk about there, it being okay for men of a certain income level to cruise in the Oak Room at the Plaza Hotel. Obviously, there are many, many people of different lower incomes and different colors that would not have been welcomed in such a setting. Um, and there, those and the men in that Oak Room setting, like James, are going to feel threatened by drag queens, by people of color, by the people who were behind what happened. Uh, at the Stonewall Rebellion, and thank you for correcting my terminology on that, because I think that's how I should have uh, referred to it in the first place. But today, even today, all the things that we've achieved, including marriage equality, um, were largely engineered by uh, ver very diverse organizations, um, and yet the the people who seem to get the credit for it are always the white guys. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, part of the, the sort of joy of doing research for this book is, um, you know, I, 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 I had a really sketchy, imperfect sense of queer history. Um, and so, you know, immersing myself in that. And I mean, of course, all of the things that we take for granted, you know, we as sort of out queer people, um, you know, the, the, 
you know, most of those things, many of those things were forged in earlier generations by, you know, people of color. I mean, they were, you know, the, you know, all of drag culture, um, mm -hmm. you know, just the sort of language that we use. I mean, you know, in the 1920s and before, there was this really sort of vibrant gay culture in Harlem and in certain mm -hmm. working class areas of Brooklyn. Um, you know, after 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 Stonewall, a lot of that stuff did get co-opted by sort of white cis men, um, you know, politically, uh, who sort of you know squeezed squeezed all the attention out of the movement. So, do you think that since uh, James never truly did come out, do you think he ever what what did he ever have a chance to sort of grow into his own skin? I mean, is it necessary to be public with everyone? Or uh, for for a person like him, or did he did he, you know, some of the articles describing this conversation you and I are having, kind of focused in on what a tormented person he was. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was this something that he ever resolved at least for himself? You know, um, I'm not sure that 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 he did ever that he did ever resolve it. I mean, he he told a close friend at some point um, in the 1960s that he really regretted. The fact that he that he was born that he was born gay, um, and um, he didn't you know it was known by certain friends that James that James Beard you know didn't didn't like being gay. I I take that to mean you know at the same time he had this this very rich kind of joyous life private life um, you know with friend with gay friends with queer friends. Um, at, you know, around his home at Greenwich Village. Um, and he, he, he resented all of the restrictions around it. Um, you know, he navigated this very curious life being one of the most famous people in America while having a life, a private life that he could not talk about publicly. Um, you know, that was quite a balancing act. And I think it, the energy to keep that up um, took its toll on James. And I think that most definitely is the part that he really did not like about being gay was that he had to do you know, constantly, you know, since he was thrown out of Reed College in 1921, he constantly had to do this very um, difficult balancing act of being of, of, of public and private. But you know, I have every confidence that James Beard had, you know, did have this core of happiness. That he did have this, you know, he was comfortable with who he was in many ways, um, you know, just not um, not living a public life. Well, we have a lot of, I mean, scores, hundreds, thousands of people to whom uh, we owe thanks for how far we've come. Uh, since that was the predominant uh, state of being when one is uh, has a different sexual orientation. Um, I, I would like to wrap our, our talk up with the very exciting news that, can you, I'm trying to make it so you can see, is, is this backwards? Oh, no, 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 good. Oh, it's, you can read it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, man, the man who ate too much, uh, John Birdsell's biography of James Beard, has been optioned for a movie. Yes, yay. Yeah. So I'm, exciting. Yeah. So really, the, yes. Um, yeah. It's being adapted by uh, two great authors, Andrew Sean Greer and um, David Gilbert. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, I know these things take a lot of time, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's wonderful that, you know, your book was just out uh, but, but before this happened. And I think it's tremendously exciting, both because I, you and I are both so fascinated by James and so in love with this industry. Um, the fact that it, people think his story is as interesting as you and I, as you certainly found it and made it for those of us who've read the book and you saw the post-its, there are lots of them, lots and lots of post-its. Um, what is it like when you tell someone, <laughs> you've got a few yourself, yeah. <laughs> you write a book that big, I'm sure you sometimes forget what you put into it. <laughs> Um, but it makes you want to speculate who should play and maybe other people who are watching us talk who should play James Beard in a Hollywood movie I know and you know 
I I'm imagining that there would be James at different ages. So there might be so there might be a few actors. <laughs> hey, um, that makes sense. <laughs> and maybe they would all meet at some point <clears throat> in the same room. Uh, certainly, certainly at the uh, cer certainly at the star-studded uh, premiere, I should yeah. imagine. Um, well, thank you, John. It's been such a delight to talk to you uh, again. And I wonder, I'm not exactly sure how the, how the obviously I'm not that well versed with technology today, uh, but I wanna throw, throw this back to the folks um, uh, who made this all happen, uh, Southern Arizona Senior Pride. I know we wanna take some questions from our, from our audience. And I wonder how do we go about that? Oh, hi. Hey there. Well, thank you so much, Ted and John for that, that fascinating discussion. So uh, yes, if everyone's following along in the chat, there's been some, some questions along the way. And uh, I'm gonna scoot back to an early one and ask you, uh, this came from John. Did earlier biographies prior to yours, John, did earlier biographies delve into the sex life of James Beard? If so, how did they handle it? And if not, how did they skirt it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so there were two um, earlier biographies of James, one published in 1990 called Epicurean Delight and one in 1994 um, that's now called The Solace of, of Food. Um, the 1990 one um, is a great biography. It's, um, it's by Evan Jones, who was the husband of this famous New York cookbook editor, Julia Child's cookbook editor, um, Judith Jones, mm -hmm. who also edited James Beard's last you know, six, six books. Um, James had died in 1985 and the Jones biography came out in 1990. Um, uh, James's books were still, and, and the books that, that he did for Judith were still selling very well. And it was, um, it was really controversial. Uh, James's being gay was really kind of controversial then much more than now, of course. And so uh, it's really minimized in that book. It's acknowledged, but there's not too much detail. Um, and it's almost treated like a sort of inconvenient fact, which I believe that for James's, James's editor, it, it, it was <laughs> an inconvenient fact. Um, so it's kind of acknowledged, but not really in any detail. Robert Clark's biography in 1994, which is amazing. Um, Robert Clark talks about it in much more detail. Uh, he talks about, you know, talks about and speculates men who James Beard uh, might have dated um, and really talks about James's sexuality in a much more integrated way with the rest of his life and accomplishments. Um, and I spoke with Robert Clark when I was, when I was doing my book and, um, you know, he told me when he was um, doing his research in 1994, he, uh, there was tremendous pushback from sources, people who were friends wow. of James, knew him, who didn't want him to talk much about James's sexuality, who were still sort of, you know, protecting his image, who didn't want to embarrass the legacy of James Beard. And so he got some information, but he told me that he got a lot of, uh, forgive the term, kind of stonewalling. Um, about that. So, um, so yeah, so I felt that even though Clark did a really good job that there was a, a biography to be told from a, you know, uh, a queer centered um, point of view. So even the people, James's friends and colleagues were a part of building that wall and oh. preventing the real story. Yes, absolutely. I mean, he, Robert Clark told me about, um, you know, meeting with one important source, a really good, good friend of James's, and um, uh, uh, who's no longer around. And, um, you know, they sat down at a restaurant, and she just put her hands up. And she said, you know, the first thing out of her mouth was, if you want to know about James Beard being gay, I can't help you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to talk about that. Um, so that that was sort of what he came up with. I encountered that a little bit. I mean, remarkably, even you know, with the much fewer people who are still around uh, who knew James Beard, I caught a little bit of that. Like, you know, there's still this sense that you know, a, a, a famous person, uh, you know, a beloved sort of person, character, um, their 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 public image, their legacy has to be protected, and you know, like kind of like. You know, where are you coming from? You know, what 
sort of thing. So. Well, a, a related question that's been sent to me, given the great links that uh, James Beard went to to con conceal some of his life or keep it very private, what were some of the methods that you had to engage to, to learn about that private life? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 I quote a uh, sort of activist, Avram Finkelstein, in my introduction, um, the, the, he's, uh, you know, parenthetically, he's the one who came up with the phrase silence equals death in the 1980s. But mm -hmm. Avram um, talked about, um, talks about uh, this archaeology that is necessary when looking at queer experience and queer lives that um, you know, so much of dominant culture wants us to be invisible, um, doesn't want us to exist uh, historically. That um, you know, James had, James, I believe, destroyed a lot of primary evidence about his own life himself. You know, he was sort of well known for not keeping letters, you know, destroying letters. Um, and I believe that his close friends knew to do the same thing, um, you know, even if he never had a explicit conversation with them, that, you know, you just knew at that time that you would have to sort of protect yourself and protect your friend by just destroying anything that would seem incriminating. And so, yeah, it was a real challenge. I mean, for me, it was following instincts. Um, you know, for instance, um, I felt like um, even though I knew, I, I didn't know that James had a connection with the Mattachine Society, um, I felt like he was famous enough and in a position where he might have had a connection. Um, so I went to the one archives in LA and sort of, you know, fished around for a day. And at the end of the day, you know, did find a letter that connected James to some discreet kind of, you know, Mattachine work. Um, so it was that kind of thing. But there were a lot of leads like that that never, a lot of intuitions like that that never pan, panned out. So it was like re looking really carefully at, at the archives to see what other biographers had missed or had not wanted to notice. Um, and to, I, you know, I think just bring also a, a gay understanding, a queer understanding to the archival materials that do exist. Um, you know, to know how he was likely to have concealed certain things, but finding, you know, finding the clues, you know, finding the erasure marks <laughs> on the pages. Thank you. A, a question that arose early in the discussion, um, how do you think that uh, James Beard's career beginning just after the Great Depression might have uh, affected his perspectives and choices and approach to, to food and eating? Um, that's interesting. I, I think, you know, he, um, um, he grew up in a world uh, in Portland, Oregon and along the Oregon coast where um, his mother was a real champion of eating what was around them, of eating locally, uh, you know, we would call it. Um, you know, for instance, in their East Portland neighborhood, um, you know, she was she was she was born in England, so she had this this sort of English love of foraged mushrooms. <laughs> and so after the rains in Portland, um, she and sometimes James and their cook would sort of go out into empty lots and harvest harvest mushrooms. Um, and you know these were a great a great treat. And so James Beard um, didn't. Uh, you know, he loved inexpensive foods. And, you know, part of his whole argument was that the really common sort of inexpensive foods that were around Americans, um, but that they didn't consider as uh, special, that they didn't, certainly didn't consider as, you know, gourmet food, that's a word James hated, but um, so something, a simple dish of ham and eggs, he would argue, uh, or a sim, uh, you know, a boiled potato <laughs> could be gourmet food, could stand up to great food, great country food that you would have in France or Italy or Spain, for instance. So I think, um, you know, the gourmet American movement of the 1930s was about 
was about luxury, you know, was about eating imported caviar and imported foie gras from France, whereas James Beard had a much simpler sense of food that, you know, perhaps was influenced in some way by his experience in the depression, um, but probably much more kind of, you know, influenced by his uh, childhood um, on the Oregon coast, especially, you know, foraging and eating what was plentiful and cheap. You know, John, we talked about the, the women that made James's career possible, and I don't think we named his mother by name. Her name yeah. was Elizabeth. So from a very foundational way, for the, big, the entire beginning of his life, it was his mother who was training him about this, the importance of seasonality and respect for that. So I think we need to raise a glass to her as well. Yes, and, you know, she, um, you know, James was an only, was an only child, and, and um, you know, she had an absolutely, you know, loveless marriage to James's father, really a marriage of convenience, you know, she wanted a child and, but, you know, she was, um, you know, the most important love affair in her life was with a woman. Um, and so, you know, James, James learned how to um, sort of manage, <laughs> I think, his, his sexuality in a way, um, you know, through kind of watching his mother. Ted, Ted and John, do you have uh, a favorite James Beard cookbook? Do you have favorite recipes that you'd like to share with us? Cool. Uh, let's see. I, I was going to get my... Um... I didn't bring my cookbook library with me up, yeah. up here, I'm afraid, but yours, no. you've got yours. So yeah, Delights and Prejudices. And I think this is backwards, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, um, but yeah, Delights and Prejudices, which is from 1964. Um, it's an imperfect book, but it's, uh, I think it's fascinating and brilliant. Um, it's, it's, the publisher wanted it to be a memoir, uh, wanted it to be autobiographical and fought with James because obviously there were so many details of James's actual life that he couldn't share. But James saw it as a history of his life through tastes, dishes, restaurant meals, um, things that he cooked. So I think in that sense, it's uh, really kind of groundbreaking. And again, talking about the influence of women on him, he, uh, you know, a major influence on James with this book was um, Alice B. Toklas and the Alice B. Toklas book, where she sort of, you know, he had this, it, it's a memoir of, you know, Alice's life with Gertrude and what they ate. And James wanted to do something similar. Um, so yeah, Delights and Prejudices is fantastic. The recipes and Delights and Delights and Prejudices are great. A lot of it is his food growing up in the Oregon coast. The potato recipes alone, I know this sounds silly, um, but something like hash browns. I mean, to me, that's the pure brilliance of James Beard. It's absolutely simple, um, you know, hash browns. It's just like butter and potatoes, but you have to cook them, you know, to get the right potatoes, the right butter, and you have to cook them in the right way. So they're absolutely crispy, um, soft inside, delicious, um, you know, at a time, you know, 1964, when Americans were eating in, you know, really expensive steakhouses or really fussy French food, a book that talks about hash browns as if they're, you know, some great French dish. I mean, that's, <laughs> to me, revolutionary. So, yeah, that's, it's absolutely my, my, uh, my favorite, James. Beard. It's such I'm a great. Have to try those browns. <laughs> no. Seems like that title could be used for for many things other than a cookbook. Right. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Seems uh, almost like we could, uh, you know, apply that to to lots of LGBTQ issues right. and lives. Um, <laughs> interesting question that arose just a little while ago. Um, are the two of you, uh, John and Ted? Are you buddies? Is this uh, how you would be talking uh, at a dinner or a cocktail party? We we well, we have not met face to face. Uh, no, we, we. I would absolutely hang out with you. Um, I can't remember how the first um, and as, as I said, John and I have had a conversation about his book uh, in another forum as well, but also th through this same medium I think somebody just thought we might get you know we're similar ages we're both uh, um, uh, beneficiaries of the pride that's that, that, that you celebrate uh, at senior pride in South uh, 
southeastern um, in, in southern Arizona. Uh, maybe they, they must have just thought we would click. I don't know. I, I think we get along okay. Yeah, and and you know, I, I think you know from obviously that first season or the first cast of Queer Eye, um, you know, just like tremendous respect and admiration, and just you know, when I first saw it, first saw Ted. Um, doing 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 the food information, the food segments of that of that series. I was you know an instant fan and just felt like you know this is anyway for all the reasons like this is someone who is talking about food without you know talking about food in the context of being gay without you know apologizing without even you know having to having to having to justify its 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 existence. So. Um, yep, still not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. You know, another question that, that has just been sent to me directly here. Um, any, any thoughts on other cultural influences on uh, James Beard? What about James's mother's Chinese cook? Were there, were there other cultural influences that, that might be interesting to hear about? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I... I think for me, one of the really maddening things about researching James Beard is, is how, um, how his upbringing kind of immersed in Chinese culture or Chinese American culture um, in Portland, how, how little James talked about that later. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he absolutely took it for granted. Um, I mean, and he, he even said as much toward, toward the end of his life, a uh, friend of his who was kind of recording some some tapes with him said, you know, you were, you grew up immersed in this sort of Chinese American culture. Um, you know, I, sh I should say that James's father was a custom custom house inspector. Um, you know, he would assess assess tariffs to goods coming in from from China specifically. That was that was his specialty. And so through his work, you know, James had. Um, you know, a white godfather and he had a Chinese American godfather. Um, you know, so his father had all these connections with all these Chinese American importers and traders who were in Portland. So, you know, he would go to Chinese New Year banquets every year um, with his Chinese godfather. You know, one of his earliest gifts was, um, you know, when he was a boy, um, his, own, his own set of little chopsticks. <laughs> you know, he ate um, kanji, you know, instead of eating oatmeal or porridge as a boy, every morning he ate kanji, often with dried fish. Um, so he grew up in this, but it's not reflected in his recipes. It's not, a, it's not reflected in his later work. Um, and one of the most frustrating passages for me is in uh, James Beard's American Cookery um, in the introduction, talking about what American food is. And he talks about um, a family friend who was a Chinese American uh, missionary, essentially. Um, she and her husband would go to Eastern Oregon to the sort of farm workers and ranchers, and, you know, talk about Christianity. Um, and she cooked food from Southern China, but essentially none of the proper ingredients were available. So she had to improvise. So he talks about this as being truly American, you know, the way that she sort of improvised these Southern Chinese dishes while not having any of the ingredients, but he doesn't talk about what any of them are. I mean, that's the one, what was she doing? I mean, this, you know, this could be the foundation of, you know, uh, a great book, but, um, you know, I, I, I think it's partly that, you know, publishers were, were not interested in that. Um, and so, um, but yeah, I mean, James is, you know, I, talked about what he learned, the way people eat and shop in, you know, France and France and Italy, but, you know, the same could be said for almost anywhere else in the world. I mean, certainly China, um, you know, West Africa, um, you know, you know, Mexico, um, you know, his lessons specifically came from Western Europe, but, you know, James, um, you know, James's influences were really vast. Thank you, thank you. Well, if you've noticed in the in the chat, our friend uh, Tom Buchanan is pointing out something else that uh, Ted, you, and John have in common, and that is that you've been awarded James Beard Awards. Um, that's, that's 
makes it particularly uh, special to, to have you discussing James Beard with us today. And is today James Beard's birthday? That's right, it is. We haven't even acknowledged that. That's, that's right, May 5th. Phenomenal. You know, we, we were so excited to, to have you um, support Senior Pride by, uh, you know, joining us for, for and, and holding this kind of discussion for our community, because of course, we do all feel deeply connected in our, in our LGBTQ identities and experiences and history. And it's, it's wonderful, uh, John, to have you helping us explore the past of people who, you know, in, in or out of the closet, we're all sharing the experience and it's all very meaningful. And, uh, you know, Ted, your, your celebrity status is something that we're all proud of. And, and we really cannot thank you enough for, for being, becoming part of our community um, helping us explore these, these topics together. It's a little hard to have a round of applause on Zoom, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure that everybody in the audience would, would <laughs> right, love to, to snap their fingers or um, share some, some reactions and, and clap hands to thank you. So this would, would be a great time to do that. May uh, I just sneak in one, may I sneak in one last question? Please. Because I think this one might be revelatory and I know I know John you get this one all the time but I just think it's funny because James being such a big theatrical person uh what would James Beard think of the fact that his name is synonymous with that his that the James Beard award is the Oscars of the culinary world which it truly is it truly is what would he think about that oh he'd be absolutely absolutely thrilled I mean you know um you know ego was no was certainly no problem for James <laughs> so uh yeah, he'd be absolutely thrilled. I mean, I think he'd be, um, you know, he'd want it to be many, you know, he'd want to expand uh, the recognitions and the honors. Um, you know, he, um, I had been asked this before and I know that, you know, the James Beard Awards, even though, you know, it honors sort of writers and uh, filmmakers and TV personalities, um, it does, you know, its main focus is on chefs and restaurants. And I think James Beard was so, was, you know, in some ways interested in food well, well beyond chefs and restaurants. Um, so I think, you know, individual artisan producers would be something that James would love his medal, his image, uh, his, his, his name to honor. So I have a secret hope that the James Beard Awards, when they come back, because they're on hiatus, um, that they sort of expand who they who they who they who they celebrate. I have a feeling that might happen. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. Well, I'll remind everyone that this discussion will be has been recorded, and we'll be sharing it on our website. It'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, so many people who joined us today donated generously to Senior Pride, and we, we truly appreciate that. If you didn't have the opportunity yet to support our mission, uh, we're at www.soazseniorpride.org. Uh, we also have some upcoming events. Um, our speaker series, a local writer, will be sharing letters to young Carlos, which is a story of coming out in a border town uh, and what that was like in the past. Also, um, a great speaker series event on May 11th that's just looking at uh, what's ahead for older LGBTQ adults uh, as we come out of the pandemic and uh, look at some, some new policies that are being enacted to, uh, to support folks. So that, uh, that wraps up our event for, for today. Uh, we'd love everyone to, to join Senior Pride, uh, sign up for our weekly e-news, be a part of everything that, that we're working on. And John and Ted, we, we sure hope to see you again soon. And um, just, just th thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. It's been fun. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, then uh, wish everyone a, a, a great afternoon and uh, let's stay in touch. See you next time. Bye, everybody.